I know people have been waiting on a new animation for me for years by now, but just indulge me. I'm making something a little easier, okay? I'm tired. So I've been trying to do this video where I talk about horse games for months now, but I keep leaving it so long to do it that a new demo or trailer comes out just when I'm ready to record and... Okay. Hey there, I'm going to talk about this odd little phenomenon that's happening in the horse fandom, which is the sudden turn we've taken into game development. Uh, when I started doing this thing back in June, a, a little bit different had just come out with a playable demo for Ambient Prologue, I, well, which is now Ambient White, apparently. Uh, a pretty and atmospheric but kind of weird and aimless looking 3D game of some description. Um, I immediately found myself with two touchdowns for comparison, uh, Overmare Studios' Fallout Equestria and Equidev's Horse Game. Uh, and these are just the most similar games out there, I wasn't even going to drag in like Legends of Equestria or uh, Them's Fighting Herds, uh, Super Lesbian Horse RPG or any of the smattering of 2D games that exist, uh, because there are enough games in this 3D space to, like, make meaningful comparisons. Now, what a lot of people would do would be to try and play Game Reviewer and give these things a score out of 10, complete with flimsy justification for the decision, or just mindlessly hype them all because bronies have no idea how to be critical and literally have no concept of taste, but I want to go one better. I want to talk about game design. So get ready for esoteric rambling about super extra concepts here we go! So before I get to the good stuff, and by good stuff I mean theory lecture, I want to clear some of the cruft out of the way and give like a you know, primer on each game and the obvious problems with each game has that aren't attributable to being in development or maybe just haven't been seen yet. Ambient White came out with a playable demo in June and they have two large gameplay trailers showing some story elements. I can't tell much about the game from them other than that it's an atmospheric adventure platformer with some combat magic and puzzle stuff thrown in. The first one attracted the attention of one Jim Sterling. These games are concerned as far as Steam Green Oh. Oh, I see. It's, uh... It's the exact art style of, early for the moon to rise? of my little pony. And highlighted big problem number one, the way the story is being told. We don't know much about the story, but from the broken English on the Patreon page... How is it fells to be immortal? Is there really any way to make whole world like ours a happier place and much, much more? And the stilted dialogue... Baldy. Veronica! Creeny once asked me about that repetition. Every sunrise has its own specific colors. Close to land, you know, warm. I don't know. Without this dumb snow. Do you have to be like into the, the My Little Close Pony snow. stuff to get any of this? Or is this incomprehensible even to fans of the show? The impression I'm getting is that A, the person running the show's first language is not English, or B, uh, this is their first time trying to tell a story and they're tripping over every single beginner mistake. I'm willing to bet that it's both because there's a fee contact link in the second trailer and there are other signs that this is their first major project and they have no idea how to direct. Which brings me to problem number two, which is the overstuffed mechanics. Uh, Ambient appears to be trying to do everything at once. This is a problem I call first story syndrome because I've noticed that in an author's first fanfiction they will try to tell a magnum opus that references every single thing in the canon they're drawing from and you end up with lots of elements that are gratuitous, conflicting, or otherwise nonsensical. Ambient is doing this with mechanics. You want spells? Here's spells. You want puzzles? We got loads. Here's a boss fight. Here's hats. Inventory, currency, a marketplace. Is the next demo going to have microtransactions too? And this brings me to Ambient's biggest sin, and it's not actually a matter of critical taste, but of information security. <laughs> this is the menu. It's pretty, but it's also way over animated and pretty laggy, uh, and you can see breakages in it, but it's also not the first screen you see in the game. There's a login screen before this, uh, and you have to make an account to play the demo, and there is presently no account recovery features, so I don't have any footage of this login screen because I've forgotten the password I used. This is kind of unacceptable. Um, of these three games, Ambient is the only one that asked me on starting it to let it through my firewall, and on my second time running the game, uh, the executable disappeared because my antivirus treated it as suspicious. And it had good reason to. Securely strong passwords are astonishingly difficult to pull off. You, you really shouldn't store passwords yourself if you can at all avoid it. If you are running any kind of web service and, and you are storing passwords, it is so incredibly easy to get it wrong uh, that basically you shouldn't try. Please, a little bit different. If you take nothing else away from this video, remove this feature. This is a security nightmare that you don't want to get yourselves into on your first game. Moving on. Overmare Studios Fallout Equestria is an adaptation of the fanfiction Fallout Equestria. I have 
opinions about Fallout Equestria the story, but I'll keep them out of it because that's not what I want to talk about. As adaptations go, it seems to be doing pretty well, though it's still obviously got a long road ahead of it. They had a demo out at the start of the year and another one out in September. Most of the footage in this video is from the earlier demo because the later demo has serious optimization issues and crashed my computer entirely the second time I played it. But it did fix a lot of the issues I had with the earlier demo, such as introducing a quick select menu that's actually really good at what it does. The game actually does have some problems in the initial recording. I forgot about the strange behavior with the spatialization of the sound, which I have spared you by not including it in this video. Uh, also, this rad roach can't get out from under this pallet, which is pretty funny. Automation is an issue, but that comes later in development, and this is kind of to be expected at this stage. Uh, there's a working inventory, AI, there's even a dual wielding system for weapons and spells. That took Bethesda until Skyrim to figure out. By the way, the laser spell and anti-machine rifle are hilariously overpowered against everything you fight in the demos except the fucking aimbotting raiders. There's a few weird AI bugs, the gunplay feels pretty wooden, and the game fails to communicate a lot of information the player should really be able to do it, like, uh, did my bullet hit, uh, or is this Radroach dead or just glitching? But, you know, they're still, they're still working on it. An Equidev's horse game, uh, is an action-adventure game that's light on story, but mechanically very solid, and answers a lot of the problems with transferring ponies into three dimensions extremely well. The only demo we have for it came out in January 2015. It's a little basic and feels kind of like a tech demo, but it's a very good tech demo, and pretty much every idea that they bring to the table is creative and satisfying. The problem with horse game is that Equidev have disappeared off the face of the earth and not told us anything about it since mid-2015. Generally, you want your game to look how it's supposed to feel. The visuals of the game are the first thing the player experiences. Deus Ex's harsh neon lights and angular design set you well up well for Cyberpunk, for example. Spec Ops The Line wouldn't work if it looked like Kirby, you know? In a medium that's two-thirds audiovisual, your presentation is important. So how do you make the aesthetics work? Um, I think Horse Game is the best example of aesthetics match in play here. Well, technically Legends of Equestria is probably the best match because it literally copies the show as closely as possible without introducing any new ideas of its own, so that doesn't count. Horse Game's bright and colourful Wind Waker art style is clear and sharp and conveys the action very cleanly, which is a great backdrop for the fast-paced and chaotic action of the game. The aim of Horse Game isn't very clear, but the huge demo level is apparently the size of a 12 to 16 multiplayer level, so I'm guessing PvP was on the cards at some point. I kind of prefer the game as an exploration and combat thing, but if I was going to include multiplayer, this would be the level of clarity I'd be aiming for. More than being functionally clear, it's a joy to look at. It's just a nice place to hang out. There's a few rough edges, like the level geometry is a little too simple in some places, and I don't know what the fuck is up with that sun, but it's charming and cartoony. Uh, the cell shaded low poly models are a great look. The only thing I have to fault it for is being a little aimless, I guess. I get the impression that Equity weren't quite sure what they were doing with the game from the collectible socks and hats and stuff. Uh, they don't look bad, but they're a little jarring and break any kind of immersion you might have had in the game. Ambient White is a close second when it comes to aesthetics. It's a very different art style, uh, one more reminiscent of a JRPG. This creates a different kind of appeal. Where Horse Game's appeal is from being charming in its simplicity, Ambient's characters look pensive and demure. They're hiding in their scarves and you can barely see their mouths moving and they've got these big expressive eyes hiding under huge hair. They look like Final Fantasy characters and the world kind of does too. Uh, the test level is a little weird where... Hold on a second, I've got to spend a moment on this. Uh, the test level runs through all these mysterious stone structures but it's also filled with office furniture for some reason. I can't tell if it's post-apocalyptic, post-modern, or just whatever stock assets they had to hand. You can use your levitation to open the desks, or you can try to, because they start clipping through it, but you're meant to be able to because there are collectibles hidden in the desks that you can hear <laughs> clipping through the desks too. I'm inclined to believe the test level is entirely placeholder, because the film demos are a bit more directed. The story appears to revolve around some kind of eternal winter that you have to make go away, and this presents what I think is the weakest part of Ambient's aesthetic. God love the voice actors for giving it their all, but the script they have to work with is shite ass. And yes, this is part of the aesthetic when the trailers spend long periods of time on bland and stilted monologues and dialogue. Everything else about the presentation, the UI, the sound effects, the music, the lighting engine, the particles, the trippy, peaceful environments works together very well. Um, funnily enough, the ambience in a game called Ambient is very well put together. And my recommendation for it is to make as much of the game dialogue free as possible. The Fallout Equestria takes a swing and misses. When you're walking around this barn area, it does a good job of looking like a Fallout game. Everything's all dirty and fucked up, and with a palette as oppressive as Fallout 3's. I feel like they could be using lighting to do more to create areas of interest and liven up the area, but I'm not going to fault them for that at this early stage. No. The problem comes when you do this. The pony models have definitely looked worse, and they're not 
bad models, but the big eye, big head look is unsettling and vacant. Ambient's models have similar faces, but with its palette and the other models in the game, it creates a cohesive and appealing look. These models clash with their surroundings. They fall right into the uncanny valley. Look at these individually detailed eyelashes. These raiders look like fluorescent potatoes. Uh, the aesthetic challenge behind Fallout Equestria was always going to be tricky because there's a clash to resolve. Uh, Overmare have attempted this by trying to make their ponies fit in Fallout, and that hasn't worked very well. I mean, I guess they look kind of like the weird lumpy plastic based Fallout 3 Oblivion era models Bethesda was working with. That's not exactly a flattering comparison. I think they should have made their Fallout-ish world fit with uh, pony art style more, with some simplifications, exaggerations, and slightly higher contrast. Kind of like that Team Fortress 2 Overwatch sweet spot of cartoony 3D, but with a post-apocalyptic palette. Uh, on top of playing nicer with the pony models and not having to resort to this, it would have made the game stick out more from its parent material and present the player with something they probably haven't seen before. The skill that really sets game design apart from other media is systems design. Art, 3D modeling, coding, music, all of that was honed in other media, but only when you're making a game do you have to think about how to design mechanics, what engagement those mechanics create, and what those mechanics mean. The easiest example I can point to is combat. Any situation where the player is under threat from another game piece, but can counter that threat with other options that remove that game piece from play. Combat is an easy thing to include in video games from a systematic point of view because it creates risk and tension when introduced, and when it's over you have relief. Depending on the story framing, this can be even more complex, bringing in feelings of anger, indignation, and triumph uh, against a genuine threat, or in a conflict, betrayal, and remorse if the player has to enter combat with a character they thought was allied to them. None of these demos go that deep, but it illustrates my point. By designing systems for the game, you lay down the rules that guide the player's experience. Of course, mechanics can be bad. Uh, at a high level, they can not fit the game in question, but more basically than that, they can be frustrating, unfit for purpose, or just plain broken. Ambient White has a currency system. You pick up gems and other things that are worth a few hundred bits, and when you take them to the market, box you can sell them, uh, and according to a little bit different oddly worded promises, currency you find in the demo will be made available to you in the full game. It's also worth mentioning that when you exit the game and re-enter it, your inventory and the world reset. They're also aware of this because at the end of the big puzzle there's a save point and a button to open the door so you're not locked into the final room if you saved and exited after the puzzle. Do you see the problem here? If this system works as advertised and it's not an overly ambitious feat of netcode and login security, this demo is a money mill. I've no idea how much this money is actually worth, but the devs clearly intended to give you a lot of it, uh, what with this secret room in one of the puzzles that has like 50 gems in it. Uh, it's tedious and repetitive, but it is a theoretically infinite source of money, uh, and shows that this money marketplace thing is systemically broken. Now, I could talk all day about these games' systems and which ones are broken, but I'm going to narrow down on one from each, because all three games have approached the same idea in different ways. Magic. None of them have a perfect solution, but they've all brought interesting ideas to the table. Just a quick revision because of how long this video has taken to make. A little bit different have come back with a progress update at the end of October, where they uh, one of the things they mentioned was that they've simplified the magic system to involve less remembering which buttons to press at which time. But a lot of the things I'm about to say here still apply, so just take that with that grain of salt. Ambient's new trailer shows something a little different, but I can't figure out how it works, so I'm going to work with what was in the playable demo. Ambient's magic seems to be based on Magicka, where you press a series of keys that combine elements to create a spell. Except instead of combining elements like fire, water, stone, and Darth Vader, you combine the arbitrary elements of Flavescent, Golden, CL, and Veronica. Golden. These correspond to the keys they're bound to, but that's where the intuitiveness ends. Overmare have decided to treat spells like Skyrim, where you select them from your inventory like weapons. I had a great joke about how ridiculous the idea of rummaging in your inventory to remember what the idea of lifting something up is, but then since writing that draft they've come out with a quick select system and now I can't use that. THANKS OVERMARE! The selection of spells is small but diverse, and I imagine they're testing each class of spell before broadening it out later on. Horse game has you craft spells out of elements too, but you build them outside of regular gameplay and store them on the number keys. What's more is that the elements actually affect the resulting spell. Uh, this allows for a large variety of emergent spell behaviour and convenient access to lots of spells. In a way it takes the ideal of what Ambient's magic is trying to do, and the ideal of what Overmare's magic is trying to do, and combines them, making them better. These are three very different approaches to the abstraction of a similar concept and go on to build very different games. A skill based system like Ambient suggests a game where you have to think on the fly, and you're challenged to pull up the right spells at the right time. Overmare's system suggests a game where you collect spells and use them to complement your main weapon, and over time you replace both of them repeatedly as your character grows. Horse 
Hurricane's progress system feels like research, and after exploring and collecting enough, you take your new element back to the spell lab and see what combinations you can make, and in any given situation, you try out a bunch of your new creations to see what works. What we see here is Overmare and Horse Game doing well in the application of systems design. They match their aesthetics of play. I'm idealising Overmare's system a bit, because I'm only guessing that you're supposed to be able to collect spells as you go, but that would make sense with the kind of exploration and character possession you get in the Bethesda games that they're emulating. Horse Game also seems to be relying on exploration and progression, but it's formulated in a much more active way. You don't just find things and swap them out, you actively experiment and enhance your understanding of the game's mechanics, and use this to get around more effectively. It's not an RPG, it's more of an action platformer with some Metroidvania elements. In both these cases, the systems match the game. And then we have Ambient. Ambient... I love Magicka. I think Magic as a spellcrafting system is a work of genius. Uh, it's endlessly fun coming up with hilariously excessive new ways to turn your friends into meaty chunks, but at its heart, Magicka is a top-down action game. The Magic system is appropriate for Magicka because it's a skill challenge to execute. Ambient's combat, however, is the weakest part of the game. Whether you're letting your sister snowball you to death because you can't hit her with her fucking things, or cheesing the boss by abusing his pathing, the combat is unwieldy and doesn't feel good. Ambient's best moments are when it's a puzzle platformer, or when you're just wandering around in this obscenely pretty world. This doesn't preclude it from having an element mixing based system, as we saw in Horse Game, it can serve exploration just fine. Uh, if Ambient gave you sensible basic spell components and implied how they'd combine through flavour descriptions, then it would be another avenue of exploration. But Ambient's elements are totally arbitrary, and the game seems to know this because it gives you a spell book with all of the combinations in it, so you aren't just guessing the spells forever. The level design and some of the spells seem to be built for exploring, but the way you cast spells is built for an action game, and Ambient is terrible at being an action game. The scope of your ambitions is important if you ever want to see a release. Horse Game shows us something of an end stage of scoping too large. I don't know what happened to Horse Game, given that they could have taken the gameplay in the demo, made eight levels with it, and they'd have a solid game, but I get the feeling that Equidev's ambitions were higher than their ability. It's possible that they just lost interest, but that's something you have to factor in. Are you going to finish the game before your amateur team disbands? There's evidence that multiplayer was on the cards at some point, which is poison for a game project. As evidenced by the fact that Horse Game was not spirited away into the vault by my antivirus like Ambient was, there was no netcode in the demo, which means they didn't even start on this aspect of the game. Combined with the sort of fuzzy focus, uh, Horse Game really sounds like a placeholder name, I'd guess that Equidev's interest petered out before they got anywhere. Their scope was too big for their manpower resources. Overmare's Fallout Equestria does not appear to be faring much better. They've done a good job of making a PR splash with their in-house band The Waste Hand Whale producing loads of music and they've got plenty of basic assets, but their project is still in the baby steps, and their goal is a full adaptation of a 630,000 word story into a Bethesda style action RPG. Remember that Bethesda, a professional studio with a AAA budget, takes five or six years to finish their games, and even they come out with a hilarious litany of bugs, and they're systemically broken in a number of ways. Make a character in Fallout 3 with 10 intelligence and rush operation anchorage, and then laugh as you break the game over your knee. Overmare's latest demo marks three years since they changed from modding Fallout 3 to Unity, and I would not call this half done. It, yeah, that looks finished. If they're happy to continue their development long past the sensible, then that's fine, but assuming Boris Johnson hasn't mistaken the launch button for a macaroon by then, I don't know how many people will be in the market for a pony fan game in 2025, much less a pony crossover with Fallout. A little bit different are doing their best to avoid showing their hand, so it's hard to figure out from the materials provided how far along they are. They seem pretty confident that they're making good progress, even if it's taken them this long to figure out that they're making a game and not a movie. At first we focused on the story and atmosphere, but now we've realized that we're not making a movie or a book where those things come first. Instead, we're making a game, a piece of interactive art that you partake in as much as we do. But if their Patreon is to be believed, they have some pretty high hopes for their project. I wish that someday bronies would come to the E3 Gamescom or whatever. Remember what I said earlier about first story syndrome and all the unnecessary broken mechanics? Uh, Overmere's scope is too deep, they have all their systems in place, but they've got arse loads of content to make for the game. But Ambient's scope seems to be too broad, because they've got so many systems to get working that even if they do come out with a f finished game, it'll be 20 minutes long, and all the competing systems will at best distract from each other, both in the player's experience and the developer's attention, and at worst trip over each other in the code. You can see evidence of this in how unsatisfying the combat is, how messy the magic is, and how pointless the inventory and currency are. 
My last point will be about the ultimate goal of designing a game. It's one thing to pump out a piece of software that you can technically call a game that people play out of politeness, and it's another to produce a game that's actually an enjoyable use of the player's time. You want the player to be invested in the experience you're making, whether it's exciting action, gripping drama, whatever. There are multiple ways your game can appeal, and there are many techniques for controlling the action to maximise engagement. It's too early to examine how any of these games execute on engagement, but we can take a quick look at how a player might be expected to enjoy them. All of them seem to be relying pretty heavily on discovery and exploration. Uh, this immediately presents a scope problem, since in order to deliver on that appeal, you need to make things to discover and explore. Horse Game, I think, does this the best, because its simple art style allows large environments to cr be created fairly rapidly, and there's some mechanical exploration as well in the spell system. Despite being a glorified tech demo, uh, it goads you into trying really hard to reach places and looking in every nook and cranny to see what's there. I still think I haven't found everything yet. A lot of Equestria's environments are huge, but a lot of them are presently pretty empty, and uh, points of interest are spread apart very widely. The Wave 4 demo gives you some keyboard shortcuts to travel to different parts of the map where they do actually have everything, because actually walking there would be an impossibly daunting task. Ambient, on the other hand, appears to be limiting your exploration to a corridor, at least in the demo, which is fine. The corridor is wide enough that there are a lot of things to find, and the way the puzzles are structured trains you to look carefully at your environment. Unfortunately, this also trains you to see the bits that they missed in the polish, but hopefully the final game will have less of that. Here we see three different compromises on this mode of engagement in order to meet the demands of indie development. Horse Game is a simple art style that reduces the time it makes stuff to explore, Ambient is working with a smaller space in which to explore so they can keep the detail up, and Fallout Equestria seems to be trying not to compromise, which means that the stuff they'll have to explore it takes longer to make, which is why their demo is looking very empty at the minute. Okay, I'm, I'm running up the clock here so I'd better hurry through this last point. Each of these games has other unique ways they appeal. Um, Ambient's strongest suit is arguably its sense pleasure, the visuals and ambience make it just a really nice place to hang out. Fallout Equestria presumably is going to rely on the experience of growth later on in development since that's kind of a core part of most RPGs. All of them have some elements of expression and Horse Game has elements of challenge. But to wrap this up I'm going to talk about another appeal. Narrative. It's pretty clear that story is very important to Fallout Equestria and Ambient. Both of them have trailers that focus on their stories. Both of them are going for the high budget storytelling approach with Fallout Equestria's dialogue trees and Ambient's high minded monologues. This immediately presents a problem in the same vein as how I talked about how the exploration and discovery had to be compromised for development needs. These two games are relying on a type of storytelling that relies on a well-written script and good production values in terms of voice acting and cutscenes. I've already mentioned that Ambient's script is awful, and as for voice acting, some of these performances could benefit from better hardware and direction. These things will cause the narrative appeal of these games to suffer. When you're trying to tell a story on a budget, I think Horse Game has the right idea. There's no voice acting in Horse Game. You're presented with a little blurb and you're left to wander around the level. With this little bit of flavour text, what could have just been a level of stock assets turns into environmental storytelling. Why are you here? What is this monastery? Who built it? Who are these Sex Pistol rejects occupying it? What are they doing here? Are they hiding something? Why are they leaving socks and hats everywhere? Why am I being murdered by frogs? The human mind is very good at creating stories with a little suggestion. Dark Souls is full of this kind of storytelling and it's very effective when you're clever about it. This is why I think that of these three games, Horse Game is probably my favourite. Everything else I've talked about here, aesthetic synergy, system design, scoping, is all in service to engagement. This is how you make your game good. Uh, you give your players reasons to want to play it. You figure out what it is your game is good at, and you give it to the player in spades. So, my advice after all this, I think Overmare should seriously consider abridging the story they want to tell, because the game will never be finished otherwise. Uh, I think it needs a visual overhaul, but more than that, I think they need to be super off on their story writing to get the best story they can out of the game because RPGs live and die on their stories and you need to get it right. Uh, a little bit different need to stop trying to be everything. Literally just cut all the combat encounters and the currency system entirely. They're totally unnecessary and bog down the nice atmosphere of your world. Equidev, please just, just come back. Please just...